Uh, I'm going to take you on a little journey in A to Z. I'm going to touch base with pretty much everything about my artwork and stuff. I'm scheduled to talk for about an hour and a half. If we're lucky, it'll be an hour and a half. If we're unlucky, it'll be more. <laughs> and if I finish a little bit sooner, then I am happy to take questions. Okay, so I'm going to start. Uh, so where are we at? So A is for at the beginning. Okay, and uh, Lu Louise is going to be uh, nudging on every now and again. So, this is me at the very beginning, so to speak, in my beautiful little council house. Um, so, yes, if you just pass that one on. So, here is me and my mate, and that's Roger, my best mate at school, and I'm still mates with him now to this day, fortunately. And that's me sat on my second-hand Mark I chopper. Mark 1 is uh, very significant because the Mark 2 one was at a shorter seat. So you weren't allowed to have passengers on that. And they sort of worked that one out halfway into the 70s when everybody were falling off and skinning the knees and everything. But I'm sat outside uh, my council house, which if we move on there, uh, which was in Batemore. Now, this is uh, not the designer of my council house. That's Le Corbusier, who is a famous architect. But... Vic Allen was the architect's name for the ba Batemore Council Estate. And he uh, basically originally started building chicken shacks. And he moved on to holiday chalets. If you can move on, thanks. And he built them in the factory under the Derwent system. And he was employed to build these houses basically because they were cheap and they were quick to build up, uh, fit up, because obviously there was a housing shortage. And if you just want to just nip on. And so that's what the Vic Hallam housing looked like. And it was popular not just in Sheffield, but also kind of in the Nottingham Derby area, because that's where he came from. And I'm so besotted with my upbringing. I had, a, I had my son build me a, a, a Lego version of the house for one of my shows. Uh, I often refer to Batemore as a, uh, as a basically like a holiday camp, but without the fun. And I didn't realize, <laughs> I didn't realize at the time that actually Vic Allen did actually build holiday chalets first. So there we go. So B is for black lines, something I'm uh, known for, I guess. And this image here is by a, uh, an artist called Patrick Caulfield, a British artist from the 1960s. And I've just got some uh, bullet points here so I can make sure I don't forget everything. And I saw this image in Graves Art Gallery when I was about 18, 17, in the cafe area. And this is from a series, um, and it's, it's called Some Poems by Jules Lefrog. And there's 22 images altogether, and they're all very similar to this. It's all household objects. But I saw this, and it was kind of revelationary to me, because it was kind of cartoonesque in its approach. It's simple, straight black lines and flat colours. Yet it was hanging in an art gallery, and uh, I couldn't I couldn't believe you know that the, the accepted cartoon sort of work in art galleries. So it was kind of revolutionary. But I didn't wasn't able to sort of experiment and explore this until later on when I actually became an artist proper. And I'm going to show you now my first ever piece of work I did to try and work on the uh, Caulfield sort of experiment. And. So, but what this image, this crude image is, if nothing else, it's a foundation to part of my manifesto about my art. And one is the materials, which was David mentioned, which is emulsion paint. And the other one is uh, MDF board. And the MDF board that this was supposed to be for was like a shelf in our house. Uh, but I'm terrible at DIY. And so it was lying around there for ages. And my wife is a very colourful person, very beautiful. And all those colours are basically emulsion paints uh, that have been on our living room walls at some point in their existence. <laughs> so I used those two elements and tried to, just basically to, to do a painting. And it, it wasn't basically about how I discovered, you know, it wasn't basically the themes that I'm known for, but I was just experimenting with how to do it and what it would look like. And this character in the corner here, we'll come back to him. Because he, he plays a key role in uh, 
this, this and beyond. So C's for collaboration. So I'm gonna, what I'm going to do with this talk tonight is it's not going to go uh, chronological and linear in my career. It's just basically I'm going to dip in and out. So I've been lucky uh, over my time to get a few, quite a few collaborations uh, work for me. And that one was a pair of desert boots for Clarks. What else we got? This is a, a turntable for Riga uh, record, uh, record uh, company. And this, this particular uh, collaboration was for Disney. Well, a subsidiary of Disney who did uh, prints. So I was able to use my unique look, outlook on life and do a collection of images for Disney. So that was a nice one. And so I know Oasis is going to uh, crop it up there every now and again too. So what, what I'm trying to do, we're going to get these um, collaborations. What I wanted to do right at the very, very beginning of my art career is get myself established as quickly as possible because as soon as people got to talk about me and know my work the more normal people like us would be willing to buy my work and spend money um, on my stuff because it's like a big ask it's a big ask for an artist to expect people to to buy your work you know if I'm I'm producing this stuff it's a luxury item and so you, you're fighting a massive market and you've got to try and stand above the crowd and give people confidence to spend 40, 40 quid, 200 quid, a couple of grand on a piece of work. So the more that I could be talked about as soon as possible, the better. So what I used to do to try and get these was just send my work out left, right and centre to people I thought would, might be influential as gifts. So it were prints or originals and stuff like that. Yeah. So if we just went through all these, a few of the other things. Now we get to Paul Smith, which is like kind of a, he was the first person to sort of pick up on my work. Excuse me. And so I sent him this print of, a, you know, the Mark I chopper. I sent him a print of this kid in a star jump, three star jumper on this Mark I chopper. And I sent it as a gift found out where his officers were, sent it, to his, sent it to him direct. And then I got an email from him saying, oh, thank you for your gift, Peter. If you're ever in London, please pop down and uh, come and see us. So I said, right, Jane, we're going to London. <laughs> so, so two days later, I get back to Paul Smith. I said, oh, funny enough, we're in London on Thursday. Are you around? <laughs> so there was me, my wife, and our two sons, my two, two of my sons, we, both, we all got on the train and we all headed down to London just to see Paul Smith. And so he, lovely, lovely guy that he is, he invited us up into his office, beautiful, beautiful office in this middle of London. And it's absolutely jam crammed with things people have sent him. <laughs> I'm not the first person, believe it or not, to send Paul Smith something as a gift. So I felt very lucky and appreciative that I was sat there with him, having a cup of tea and some of the finest biscuits known to mankind. <laughs> and he's been very gracious to me, and he's been an absolute legend at, at times and given me great business advice on how to move my business forward and how I am forward. And uh, just like a little caveat to how, how he became successful, I was once uh, in an airport and just passing the time of day and I went into um, a, the Paul Smith subsidiary and there were some uh, Paul Smith sunglasses on there and they were like, uh, God knows how much, it was too much for me to be able to afford to buy, but I thought they were beautiful. So on one of my other occasions that I went down to see him, I mentioned these sunglasses. I said, oh, the sunglasses that you got in your shop the other day were fantastic. And he says, oh, hang on a minute then. So he says, Jonathan, which was his right-hand man, Jonathan, take Peter down into the the basement where we've got all our supplies and stuff and see if we can find these sunglasses for him. So I'm thinking, yes, <laughs> freebies are on my way. So we go down into the, into the lift all the way down into the basement floors. We're going through all these people cutting material and designing and shifting things around. And Jonathan goes to this guy, he says, Hey, David, have you got the uh, last season's collection of sunglasses? He says, yeah, I think so. Let me have a look. Those rummages in, gets these sunglasses in a big box, lifts them up. He says, are there any of these the glasses that you saw, Peter? So I'm looking through. Bang, they're there. Yes. Yeah, there they are, Jonathan. He says, oh, yeah, look at that. Uh, 
that down. Gives me this piece of paper. Says, that's the serial number. If you ever go to a shop, you can order them. <laughs> he don't give out to away. And here I am, I'm chucking things at people. So that's the, a that's the big, big lesson. So D, dress to impress. So some of the themes, I'm going to talk about some of the themes that I go through with my art. And one of them is fashion and culture. And here's some scruffy oiks in the street. And this is pretty much most of us at that age. We're coming from working class backgrounds. And the only way that we can sort of transcend our environment is to metamorphosize into something special and unique. And the way that we can do that is to get out of our cocoon of hand-me-downs and the clothes that our parents got is to fall in love with musicians and bands who will lead us the way to uh, how to look and how to dress and how to be our own individual selves and to be proud of ourselves as humans. So I think that fashion is a really big thing to talk about in my work. I'm very passionate about it. You won't tell from what I'm wearing now that I'm incredibly fashionable. But uh, if we go on to that next uh, slide. So this, for instance, is uh, it's called Upstairs at Harrington's, which is, for somebody in Sheffield my age, it was the first calling point to become fashionable in your own right. It was a market stall clothes shop, and for some unknown reason, it got everything that was on top of the pops the week before. So we all made our, a beeline to Harrington's on the Saturday to try and get a pair of, this guy is, is holding a pair of burgundy stay press trousers, which was like for the, the two-tone movement, uh, Scar, and so the specials and selector. So the two-tone trousers are beautiful, like a, two, a weave of two different colors, and they sort of shimmer. So there, there you are, there's no changing rooms at, uh, at Arrington, so you have to cl clamber upstairs, and you have to reveal your underwear to other boys up there where all the boxes of Lee jeans are and Levi's and stuff and it's, it's quite a quite a daunting experience so there is cowering so just to, and some examples of how important it is so like being in, in love with somebody like David Boy for instance you you can again you transcend your environment it lifts you from your your place and know that there's you know there's somewhere else in the world that's you know um, special and magical and unique. And, and the, the beautiful thing I think about um, fashion and stuff is it's a uniform. If you, you can become part of a, a group, an army of friends. And what I really love about that as well is that um, it's important how, uh, how far a turn up is on a pair of jeans. I love that and I love that a mod jacket has to be three buttons and it has to have five inch side vents. And if you were a skinhead, you'd have to wear Wrangler jeans or Lee jeans and no other jeans would, would work at all, you know, would do. Yeah, we can nip through. No, the Northern Soul period. What I love about the Northern Soul period is, is they were older than me as a kid. And I looked at those and they tended to be the harder kids, the rougher kids, and yet you, you put this American soul music on and we're dancing like angels, these beautiful, scary people. But of a weekend, they'd be absolutely off the rockers dancing for 24 hours. But, you know, and, and they were transcending their, their lives. So they were mechanics, they were working in machine shops, but for that brief time, they were, they were dancing like angels. Yeah, and this last few more there. So that's uh, so that guy there is sort of representing the Windrush generation, and they came into this country and they showed us how to wear hats and they showed us how to wear cool suits. And then in the roughly the same time, the Teddy Boys, who were influenced by the Victorian movement and the long frock coats, but they were also influenced by the officer gentry, uh, officer classes, who were demobbed and wearing uh, long coats, and they wanted to emulate that kind of posh look. So these battle lads getting suited up, again, transcending their environments. Right, so he's for exhibitions. I, I originally, my first ever exhibition was in a pub. It was a Washington pub. It was in 2004. It was in December. Um, I was skint. The whole family was skint. Uh, so I, I, I tried, moved on from that original painting that you saw and started to then uh, focus on 
painting my environment, which I'll come on to. So the first, so the first exhibition was in a pub, and then the next one was in a bar, and then the rest of the times I was showing in little cafes and restaurants. Uh, there was a place called Mash House, and it was only about 10 foot by 18 foot. Uh, but there were enough room for me to put these 12 inch square paintings on the walls, about six or seven of them. And every week they'd be ringing and saying, we've sold one, can you come down with another one? So I'd run in, get another 12 inch square piece of wood, paint something up and bring it down and hang it up. And they were going for like 90 quid a throw. And it started a momentum, a sort of thing. So I then had to start making more exhibitions and going and doing it all by myself, obviously. So. We've got this class worse than don't adjust your mindset. But the problem was is I started from a pub and as it, the momentum grew, I had to go, go bigger and find bigger environments so people could come and more people could see the work. If you can just nip it on one more for us. And then finally, this one. And it gets to the point where I'm in the Magna in the turbine room erecting this massive show and this is just like an example of the build-up that has to be done to make a show like, um, like Six Weeks to Eternity. I got a guy who's a set designer who works for the Cru for Crucible Theatre. I got a guy who'd um, got a, a Capri car, so can I borrow it for the next installation? I got to, this guy here, he's Pinball Jeff, and he set up his pinball arcade for us. And I think there were only about 20 paintings. The thing was, was, how do I fill a turbine room with, say, 30 paintings? So I just had to make it bigger and bigger. But it also had to be bigger because um, so many people wanted to come and see it. But the problem with all this is, is that I can't afford to run the shows for any length of time because it costs an absolute fortune. Like, th these shows, they cost about £60,000 to put on. So I can only have them on for like two days or something daft like that. Now this show was the Joy of Chef. So this was only on for a day and it was in a, another factory unit and it was just out, uh, out near Meadow Wall. So I even I had a, just as part of the show, just not necessarily um, for any uh, aesthetics, but I, I I hired a vintage double-decker bus for the day to shift people from Pond Street to the venue to make it so it was quite accessible for people if they uh, couldn't get there easy enough. And we only charged them two pence because that's uh, where the price was to go on a bus in Sheffield, obviously, back in the day. So this bus cost about 400 quid to hire for the day and it ran full there and back and it amounted to about 22 pounds in two peas. <laughs> But while I was at the show on that Saturday morning, I was just loitering around, just trying to bask in the glory of everybody turning up to see this show. Somebody said, Pete, a friend of mine, in fact, said, can you sign me this print? So I said, yeah, of course I will. And then there was another person behind him. Yeah, yeah, sure. And then after about five minutes, there were like 20, 30 people, and they were blocking what they could see of the show. So they had to shove me into the car park and I was sat there and I stayed there from 10 in the morning till probably about five or six at night, just signing. So it meant that I can't see my shows now in person when they're open because I, I can't have that done. So what I thought for the um, six weeks to eternity show, I come up with a great idea to be able to see the show without getting bothered.
<laughs> As you can tell, I'm knackered by then. <laughs> yeah, so I was absolutely sh uh, absolutely completely crackered at that point. Uh, I, I'd actually, I, I was, uh, I'd diagnosed with cirrhosis of the liver, which I'll talk about later. So I, was, I wasn't very well while that show was going on, but I was so desperate to go out. I thought I could put this on it, it'd be no problem, but I couldn't hardly breathe. It nearly absolutely killed me after about 10 minutes in, in that costume. So they just, I only managed to go down to one end and back again, and they helped me back out again. So, F is for fanzines. Now, the fanzine bit for this is because it was basically the start of it all as an artist. As uh, it's been pointed out, I got rejected um, at, for, for, uh, the, for universities up in um, Newcastle. And so what were we going to do? I was going to make a living now that I couldn't be an artist. I thought, well, chuff them. I'll do something I don't need a degree for, and that's become a cartoonist, because I've always loved drawing cartoons. So I'm a big Wednesday fan, so I identified that this fanzine, View from the East Bank, didn't have any art cartoon work in it at all. So I, so I approached the guy, I said, can I draw cartoons for this fanzine? He said, yeah, sure, no problem. Um, so I haven't got much money, which is an offer, it's a very much a, a concurrent theme when people are hiring cartoonists or artists is, I ain't got much money. Can you knock something out for me quick? Uh, so I said, fair enough, I don't mind. I just need to get this. So this was the first ever paid work that I ever did was drawing cartoons for the fanzines. So I'd do about 10 or, or eight cartoons per issue and I'd get 50 quid in cash, back pocket, fantastic. And I did that for about eight seasons and that price never went up. It was <laughs> six, 50 pounds. And I was killing myself for it. But the, the, the good thing about that was, is I started, you can nip that on, I started with the fanzine, but the, someone in the Sheffield Telegraph, Peter Markey, who was a beautiful, brilliant person, who was a, like the sports editor for the Sheffield Telegraph, Scottish guy from Glasgow, he picked up on one of the pictures that I'd done for the fanzine, and he published it in the back of the page of the Telegraph. And someone said, Pete, Pete, your cartoon's in the back page of the Telegraph. I said, what, really? So, oh, good grief, right. So I rang up the Sheffield Telegraph. I said, can I speak to such and such? Can I speak to the person at Sheffield Telegraph who, uh, you know, in the sports department? So he put this Scottish guy on, and he said, hello. I'll not do the accent. He says, yeah, it's, it's me. I'm Pete, the cartoonist who you put my cartoon on the back page. He said, oh, yeah, how are you doing? He said, yeah, yeah. Can you pay me? <laughs> he said, yeah, I'll, yeah, of course, of course I can. Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, I'll give you some money for that. He says, also, can I do some cartoons for you as well? And he said, well, give it a go. So next Thursday, the night before, I did about 30 cartoons, sports cartoons, and took them down to him in that morning, and he picked three or four of them. He said, yeah, I like these. We'll publish this one. And that was it. That was the start of our relationship with Sheffield Telegraph. And the beautiful thing about Sheffield Telegraph is I'd got now in my pocket, when I started painting, some pe people were willing to prick up their ears and talk about me as an artist. And it was incredibly valuable. So the humble, so that from the starting point of this 50 quid tele cartoons, primitive point, ended up me as a painter because of these beautiful uh, journeys, these little connection points. And one of the good things about doing fanzine work and stuff like this is it, it, it focuses you to work with deadlines. And it also teaches you how to find and navigate a punchline from a story that's seems nondescript, maybe about a player's injury or the fact a player can't score goals. So you've got to try and work out how you can make a cartoon about these particular stories. So it was a great learning curve, which goes on to other things in life uh, when it comes to creating things and how you can, with a blank piece of paper, um, come up with something. Uh, right, geez, for golf, I'll keep this brief. I've, I've recently taken up the glorious sport of golf. And I kind of wish I looked like him, <laughs> but I look like him. So, so I want to be Sean Connery, uh, and I end up being like the other guy's villain. Uh, but I have actually touched on golf as a subject in the past, and this 
here is dad skills where every dad uh, it's, it's their duty to beat their child at sports <laughs> because at some point that child will beat you and then you will never play that sport ever again um, yeah but the reason I put I picked up golf as a sport because everybody goes golf oh my god and I agree I don't think artists should be have sport do sport at all I don't think I don't think anyone would have taken any uh, appreciated Picasso if they knew he worked out of the gym every morning or, or uh, basically, um, uh, Van Gogh did a bit of parkour at Montmartre and stuff. So I, I, I'm repulsed by the idea of physical exercise and art. It shouldn't be together as a bedfellow, but because I got ill, um, I needed something to keep me fit and something that are, uh, I could participate with my son. And he took up golf at the same time. And I now did it as well because there's a transplant games that goes on and so far i take part in that so that's my excuse but i've also got a lovely cabal of about eight of us and we're all socialists so we can sneer at all the other tory golfers and stuff like that <laughs> so health so if we just nip back there so it's no big no big uh, secret that i I've, a I've had a liver transplant and I had cirrhosis of the liver which was diagnosed about eight years ago and six years ago I had the transplant and this is me a few days after the transplant and the, the joy, the absolute revelationary joy of having that transplant was just immense, it was overwhelming. I had a friend who, um, who we were actually funnily enough we were schoolmates called Sean Bloodworth and we had a class reunion a few years ago when I'd just, uh, I'd not been diagnosed with cirrhosis. I was just going through the process of not drinking so they could do blood tests to figure out what I'd got wrong with me. And he was drinking soda water too. So I said, oh, what you got it for? He says, oh, I've got cirrhosis of the liver. And I had it, got it years ago. And uh, so he kind of knew what the journey I was about to embark on. And he said, whatever they tell you to do, do it. Because, you know, it's an awful thing to live with. And so we then went on this journey together. And unfortunately, Sean wasn't able to get a transplant in time. He was close a few times to getting a liver donor. Uh, but unfortunately, he got to hospital one day to get this transplant. And as they were waiting for the transplant, he caught the hospital bug. And he wasn't able to recover from that because he was too weak to face the operation. And unfortunately, he lost his life. And that was while I was waiting on my transplant waiting list as well. So I was very, very much aware of how fragile the possibility of getting one a liver was in our, in my existence. So when thankfully I did get the, um, the transplant, I, it was just an incredibly grateful and overwhelming experience. And this beautiful woman in the middle that me and Jane are kissing, she's Karen and her husband was a person that passed away and uh, donated all these organs to various other people who needed transplants. And so as soon as I had my transplant, I, the first thing I promised myself was to get in contact with the person that had allowed this to happen, this, 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 um, for me to be able to have a liver. And you don't know who this person is, you don't know what their background is, if they've got children or not, but you have to start this letter saying, thank you so much, this means, you know, what you've done and I explained everything about myself in a sense. And she finally found out who I was because I'd been on Look North because of the liver disease and the operation. And so her friends in the Women's Institute, just around the corner from uh, Leeds, said, oh look, this guy just had his transplant same time as your, your husband I passed his organs on. So she, she, she let in a letter to me, said, are you that person? Are you?" you got my husband's liver and i couldn't tell her if i had had an a because i didn't know but b you're not supposed to you're not supposed to give you the information out but anyway to cut a long story short we finally get to meet and we're good friends and she's a genius and she now promotes the the concept of uh donorship uh, uh full time now she, she basically gives her life up to encouraging people to to become uh, organ donors and because of that journey, I, I've become obviously uh, uh, besotted by the NHS and what they do and the, the staff. And uh, I, was, <laughs> I had a heart valve replacement, a mechanical heart valve 
a couple of years ago. And while I was sat there in bed, I saw them doing a handover uh, where the one, when the night staff hand over the information to the morning staff and vice versa. And as I was going for a wee, one of my many wees while I was there, um, it was in the morning, the, light, the lamp was turned on and it was kind of the curtains were all closed. It was, Feb it was a, like a November morning and it was just like this Rembrandt sort of esque image that struck me. So I got, went, did a quick sketch of it and then a few, few months later, or in fact a year later, I, I were able to start and have a go at painting it. And so, um, so, so the, the NHS features quite a lot in some, well not quite a lot, but it does feature my work and this is called the uh, National Hug Service. Uh, I've got to know more about uniforms now, but I always assumed nurses' uniforms were white and a bit of colour on them, so I did this one with white and a bit of colour, and it turns out she's a physio. <laughs> <laughs> so why are you being embracing a physio? I'm sure it was some good, good le leg stretches or something. But, um, ah, is it starting now? So this brings me on to this, this particular thing. It's for a show that I did called um, This Class Works. And I'll just pause it for one second, if we can. So this, is, uh, this class works. And as we're telling you about Sean and his illness and my illness, when you start deteriorating with, with a, a illness, you, you live inside yourself, you live inside your body, and you, you move with that decline. Uh, until at some point you realize you're not doing hardly anything, you're still sat on the settee and you can't do this and you can't do that and you become this ghost of a person. And I, I was sat there um, one day, and I thought, Christ, if I, if I die, I don't want them, their last thoughts of me is this shell of a human, this uh, husk of a person. I want them to remember me as I was, and not this to be the last memories they've got. So it brought me onto this painting, and it's, it's, it's about a guy an old guy and it's end of life and he's in the hospital and his family's around him and I wanted it to be like an altarpiece. I like to go on the holidays abroad and go into Catholic churches even though like I'm an atheist I do like churches I do like the the feeling you get inside them and you get to those kind of ones where there's the candles you can light or you put a euro in to light and I really like those I like the idea of those so I wanted to make this thing that had this ability to have this votive offering that you had this memory of somebody so I got people to I did this painting and I put it in a little area on its own and I got Martin Ware from Heaven 17 to write some music for it and he, him and his son did that and it's this so it's all in its place this piece and there's a little sandbox and I asked people I gave people a lollipop stick and to put the name of someone they'd lost or they loved and put it in the sandpit in front of the painting when they see it so this is the result of that
Yeah, so the, all those lollipop sticks are the result of everybody who came into the show and put in um, a person that they loved in there. So it was a very emotional piece of work, that one. And it, it got people going. So I'm really proud of that. that. Um, so, eyes for influencers. Artists get influenced by everything around them. There's no point trying to pretend that you're unique and individual because you're not. I, I have a, a follow a podcast and it's called The History of Music in 500 uh, Songs and it's by a guy called Andrew Hickey and he's an absolute scholar on this and he starts right at the very beginning uh, in the 1930s when like music starts getting recorded and then by the time you've got to the Beatles and he's not even 10% into the actual thing, he's already telling, dis, dismantling the Beatles and their riffs like Day Tripper is where they where George Harrison got that guitar riff from was a song which was done like three years before and stuff. So even like we think the Beatles are unique and individual, they're, they're, they're magpies, they steal from everything. We all do as artists. So I, I like the idea of, of kind of talking about influences and, and being open about it. So for instance, this is Hopper. Hopper, he, um, he showed me that pathos is a, is, is a, is a subject matter worth exploring. So I like to try and give people an emotion when they see my work, whether that's laughter or, or sadness. One of those two, as long as you've got something and you've seen it, then I've won. We've both had a communication with a picture. We've, all, we've both had an experience. So Hopper's a, a person that I really admire. And then there's uh, oh, correct, Vermeer. And Vermeer, the fact that he's painting peasants rather than... Um, kind of gods and warriors and stuff. So bringing it down to, to normal people was a great, and, and the beauty of his work is so wonderful. And then Manet again, he, uh, painting real people, everyday people. So there's a barmaid in the, um, uh, oh, what's the one? What's the? Berger, that's the one, yeah. And then uh, Miro, beautiful bold colors and black lines. Absolutely powerful and impactful imagery, you know. So again, another great influence on my work. Now this guy, this is William Hogarth. Uh, William Hogarth is a fantastic influence on me because as an artist, he would paint a picture. He would then put it in the window of his studio and he then advertised the fact that you can now buy tickets for print for my, sh for my work. So he's not interested say, to sell the original, he's interested in people buying prints of his work, saying, look, common person, you come here, you can afford to buy this print. And I thought, wow, here's a, here's a guy that's in like the National Art Gallery, the Rates Progress, and all these, and all, in fact, this subject match is quite humorous, he's selling prints. If he was around today, he wouldn't get, uh, get a, a sigh, he wouldn't even get talked about because he's quite commercial. And it's quite interesting how art, art and snobbery shifts in that respect. And another artist that I'm um, very influenced by is um, Hergé, who was creator of Tintin. And I love his colour palette. I love his, simple, his, his beautiful black lines. And he's very influential into my work, and to a point where I didn't even realise it. When I did this painting, it kind of emulated the crash plane, which was the Tintin in Tibet. Another guy that's uh, influential is Hokazai, and he did The Great Wave. I haven't got a picture of that up there. But he was in his 80s when he pr produced The Great Wave, and it's like known as it's an absolute classic. But he sold his prints for the price of a bowl of rice. But yet now he's a, na a national treasure. So selling prints and stuff isn't necessarily the devil <laughs> of the art world. So J is for Jane, my beautiful Jane my muse, who was in the audience today. She's got herself a, a boot on because she broke her toe just before her birthday. Can I tell them why you bro how you broke your toe, Jane? <laughs> she broke her toe dropping a bottle of Prosecco on it. <laughs> there you got biggest laugh at night, that's good. <laughs> so basically, artists are lazy and we need we need either revenge, we're either hungry or love to make us work. Fortunately, if you're lucky, you've got all three. 
And now I've got all three. I always want to get my own back on. People who reject me. I like food. <laughs> and I was always skinned, should I say. And obviously I'm in, mad, madly in love. But Jane was a massive driving force to how I became a full-time artist because obviously I was, I was doing cartoons and I was working as well at the same time, making pin money. And then the shows, I was doing the pubs and then there was the 90, 90 pound uh, paintings that were changing every week and stuff. So slowly it was building up, building up. And we were, were I was, um, say, working uh, in a job and getting family income support and family income support. And uh, this other job was like seven, seven grand a year. And then we amassed about 7,000 pounds from paintings that I was selling or about to sell through commissions. So he said, well, why don't you pack Tesco's in and use that 7,000 pounds, which you're gonna earn you from Tesco's over 12 months. We've got it in his back pockets now, pack it in and see where we are. So bless her, she told me to do that. And we did that and I've not, worked for Tesco's ever since, and that's fantastic. <laughs> but it took that bravery and that confidence from my beautiful wife uh, to do that. And because she struggles very hard because she's got bipolar, she suffers from bipolar, and it means that I want to be around to look after her all the time. So working full time is not necessarily the ideal solution. So it meant that I had to find another way to make an income where I didn't have to ask my boss if it were okay if I took some time off and stuff because I love my beautiful woman. And so this is why we ended up with, with art. As, uh, and that's why I was working and drawing cartoons to try and make a living and not work full time. So yeah, definitely J Jane is the reason why I, I'm able to be here and start talking about my, waffling on about my work. Okay. Keep the faith, yes, keep the faith. So we're talking about revenge and <laughs> And that's what it is for, for, for artists, is, you, is if you're not getting rejected, you're not trying hard enough. You've got, you, you need, so there, I tried to telegraph, I don't know why, I was desperate for money, I guess. Uh, so I even tried the sun ones, good grief. Uh, but it's important for artists to get rejected, it's important for artists to get critiqued and told they're the rubbish. Whether they take that advice is another matter. They can either take that advice and try and change to what the uh, people are advising him, or you can tell them to bugger off, I'm gonna do it all myself anyway. One way or the other, you need to know something about what your work's doing, whether people are liking it or not. So it's really important to get rejections, it's important to just keep trying and having a focus, and even if it is like I use it for, as a force of re uh, revenge, which is, uh, it keeps me going. Uh, labels is important for me with my work, we can put these up actually. Yeah, so as well as the painting, I like to explain a little bit more about my story and my work. So when you just see, you're not just seeing an image and trying to work it out for yourself what this is. Uh, there's more to it than that. And I think it's important as artists that we, we go that little bit deeper and explain because what the label also does is it stops people for that little bit longer in front of your work so they can read it and then they can communicate and they can look and can say, oh, hang on, yeah, this is what that means. And you've, you've not just kind of gone like that in an exhibition. Mm, yeah, yeah. You stop and you look. And I'm, a, I'm always intrigued. I always want to know why a person, an artist has done that work. You know, I want to know why Van Gogh did sunflowers and I want to know why he did his bedroom. And I want to know why Picasso did Guernica. I want more information. So, and I think sometimes, like with this one, it's also about getting a little bit deeper into a subject matter to make you think more. Right, my parents and other animals. Well, it's just basically my parents, to be honest with you. So this is me, this is my mum and my dad. They look incredibly older than me in the sense that they should, you know, I should, uh, why they've got me at that age, I've no idea. So I've got, I've got two, I've got my, my two brothers, I've got a brother and sister, I run an art, Stuart, they're 15 years older. Arian, seven years older, and then there's me. So Arian was a mistake and I was a tragedy. <laughs> and this is probably the last photograph of me and my mum because my mum died pretty much not too long after that sort of photograph. She died of cancer. And uh, I didn't know much about her illness and I don't think she did really because she got diagnosed quite late on. 
And so I think like she was diagnosed in February and by the summer she had passed away. Um, so she's a very significant, very significant person in my life in that respect is um, I, I'm lucky that I can as an artist is I still have a communication with her. So one of my early works was this one, uh, which is um, called Castle Market and it's my mum and me. And it's basically, we'd go to the Castle Market, which is obviously from Pond Street up to Castle Market, feels about seven miles, I think. <laughs> if you use your pedometer, I think you'll find them right on that one. <laughs> and then by the time you've finished uh, going around all the uh, fish markets and the fruit and veg and then looking for all the bargains in the clothing department, absolutely cream cracker. But you'll end, I always would just be basically hanging onto my mum saying, can I have a treat, can I have a treat, can I have a treat, can I have a treat? eventually she would yield hopefully and so this ride is one to represent that I, that notion that me and my mum and at the end of the shopping she gave me a treat and I love painting people with shopping bags because my dad had shopping bags coming down from the shops at the spa and my mum had shopping bags and people have shopping bags basically are grounded people uh, and then there's my dad and, I, and my dad lost a finger in an industrial accident and he also had a drill bore into the back of his hand in an industrial accident he worked to, as a like a machinist uh, at laycox before then he worked for british steel but working in steel factory working in factories shorten people's lives it shortens their employment opportunities as well and you don't get paid enough for it anyway so it's rubbish so so here's my dad and he's retired now and uh, the, the thing about the lost finger ring thing is, is in, when I paint in this style, I only do people with three fingers and their thumb. And uh, lo and behold, my dad has three fingers and a thumb anyway, so that's all right. <laughs> um, he, he had a, a beautiful system once he'd, uh, once he'd retired. He'd wake up in the morning, go downstairs, the daily mirror would be on the floor being delivered, pick that up, make himself a cup of tea. He'd be at the back table open it up, look through the horses, pick out, pick out his round robin, £3.50, then go to the quiz word, do his quiz word in the, in the paper, come 12 o'clock, he'd be up up to the spa, get a bit of shopping in, have a couple of pints, go down to the Baymore pub, watch the horses not come in, <laughs> come home, have a, an hour's kip on the chair, make my tea, have another kip, go upstairs, have a shave, and go out and go to another five pints. And that was his retirement. But he loved it. He had this idyllic life where uh, that was it. That's all he needed from life was that little routine. And fair play to him, quite frankly. So uh, a bit of, hang on, I'm going to get this bell and then I'm these clang on the floor and the name drop. <laughs> so yeah, so as mentioned, uh, Noel Gallagher. Now, Noel was another person that... Uh, like Paul Smith, I sent something to in the hope that somehow he would like it and then talk about it to his fans on some kind of social media platform that hadn't been invented then. And uh, I get no more. Uh, but this was the picture that I sent him, and it's called A Good Education. So basically, for me, if you're not an academic, one way out of this is either sport or music or art and I took the art path, but I did try the music path and failed. So, uh, so this guy, this kid is just learning to play music on his guitar. I thought, well, hang on, that must be like an old Gallagher story. That's the kind of thing he's familiar with. So I, I sent it to his management, and then lo and behold, a, few, uh, a week or so later, he rings me up on the phone. I didn't know it was him, obviously. I went, hello? He goes, yeah, this is uh, Noel Gallagher. And, Ooh, what? <laughs> My knees buttled. <laughs> I'm going on, I'm going to the kitchen table while they're talking to Noel Gallagher. I'm James with boiling potatoes up for tea, and I'm saying, Noel's on phone, Noel's on phone. So he's telling me, oh, Pete, mate, yeah, you, that picture you sent me is fantastic. I love it. It's great. I said, oh, no problem, no. Hey, yeah, yeah. Anytime, you know, if you ever need me for hope, just let me know. So I put the phone down, and 10 minutes later, he rings me up again. Whoa, what, what's happening here? And he says, can you do something for this charity event I've got coming on? So I do this. So it just gets a nice little relationship with Noel Gallagher. Uh, going so we end up doing uh, teenage cancer trust stuff and I do posters now for them every year to raise money 
And then obviously the, the Council Skies thing, which is the most recent thing we've had done uh, with Noel, and he, he rang me up and asked me if I could use the title of this book for a thing uh, for his album. And I think we've got Noel talking about it. Oh, there might be some swearing in this. Uh, good old Noel, bless him. I got to sell the extra 35 books that weekend. <laughs> so I'm very pleased. Oh, oh, it's for other jobs. Is that right? Oh, it is. Yeah, I have other jobs. <laughs> so, yeah, so going back to um, me and my beautiful wife. And making a living. So I'm working, um, first off, I work at HMV. I try and become uh, a full time artist and I get rejected. So come back, I fall in love with my beautiful wife, Jane, proposed to her within about the space of about four weeks. And then we're married within another eight weeks after that. And we shack up together, and I've got to now find another way to make a living. So I decide I'm going to become a cartoonist full time. And I start doing cartoons for the fanzines and I start doing cartoons for greeting card companies and various other things. And while I'm doing that, I'm getting pin money. You don't really get paid a lot of money for being a cartoonist, unfortunately. So I end up having to work at the Royal Mail first. I worked for the post office for five years, thinking that, well, I start at six in the morning, I'm done for 12 and then I can keep doing the cartoons. Trouble is, the post office round was a massive that I had. It was, and I came back at like three in the afternoon. I was absolutely knackered. Of, all I wanted to do was watch Holmes under the hammer in my underpants rather than do any work. <laughs> so I thought, I need an easier job than this. So I go to Tesco's and get a part-time job there. And I'm doing home shopping, picking in the morning at six o'clock. And I'm done by 10 o'clock. Happy days. Again, not getting a great deal of money, but it, it was a start. And that's when I started... And I, and I remember I were in the back in the home shopping department picking some crates and a guy who I work with. I said, oh, I've just started this, uh, started doing some paintings in this particular style that's going to go crazy. People are going to love it. He says, yeah, yeah, seriously. I said, yeah, yeah, I'm going to charge 500 pounds for these. And he just laughed. <laughs> well, he's not laughing now. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to, I did actually try to charge five pound, 500 pounds at first, but no one were buying it. So I knocked him down quite quickly in that first exhibition. So yeah, but the, the, the caveat to that is, I actually got the garden interested in me uh, for the This Class Worst show, and the guy came up and did an interview with me. And we were talking about the work and what it's all about, and then they splashed the headline on the actual, uh, the, the article was Postman Becomes Artist. And I'm like, no, oh, I'm an artist who works as a postman. <laughs> so it, it was kind of like, you go, no, you can't win. You can't win with them. So yeah, piece for products. So one of the first purchases that I made when I start open my gallery uh, was a printer. It's the most interesting thing. I used to get uh, my prints done from a friend and they were charging me like 12 quid a print every time I get, I get an order on my email. Oh, can, you, uh, can I have this print of this uh, pub dog? Yeah, no problem. I ring this girl up. Can you print me a pub dog print? Yeah, that's 12 quid. I get in my car, I drive to their house. Knock on the door, here's your print. 
here's your 20 quid. It's like, and I'm driving back home again, and it's like, it's like insanity. And eventually, I get to the point where I'm allowed, the first purchase I get is a, is a G-Clay printer. And it, it's kind of brilliant. It's like, it's, it's, it's the most wonderful thing that you've got control of it all now. You've got control of what you do. But the, the, the thing about other products is, as well as prints and things, is trying to basically, I'm going to be really like kind of commercial, is monetize, earn money. Don't be scared of earning money as an artist. Be proud of it, own it. Say, look, I've got to find ways to make a living. I've got to find ways to pay me, me rent and I've got to find ways to eat and dress my beautiful woman. So it's all about finding other ways to make people part with the money because they've already got eight prints in your house. So give them a mug or give them a little statue. Give them a teapot. <laughs> they need a teapot. Give them a slip mat for the record player or the beauty of it or give them a calendar. The calendars are a great little seller and the badges. So I, I try all the time to find other ways to interpret my work into other products because it's really, really important as artists to make a living out of it. I mean, it, it's no good getting buried with 1,800 paintings under your bed and, so, and then someone else discovering it later and making a living out of it for you while you're dead. So make it while you're alive. Uh, where are we at now then? Oh, click on the draw. Yeah, so we've mentioned it before, but I, I'm a big lover of uh, cartoons. So I, I actually originally wanted to be a strip cartoonist. Grew up with like the Daily Mirror, so like the Parishers and stuff. And th these guys are handicapped, massive influence on my work. This is um, oh, a Crazy Cat, American syndicated uh, cartoon from the 1930s. And uh, the wonderful Calvin and Hobbes. Oh, again, you know, just a brilliant, brilliant drawings, brilliant kind of storytelling, so beautiful and, and, and brilliant. Uh, and I tried it myself, and this was the first, not the first attempt, this was one attempt. And we're back to that guy now, that in that original painting, that we showed you right at the very beginning. And the reason that I used him is because of his, his eye and nose construct. It's quite simplistic, but yet is kind of, you know he's present within the picture. And uh, it was a way of me being able to paint without it being totally cartoon-like. So if I started putting eyes in and stuff, it would become too cartoon-esque. And I wanted it to be like fine art. So I tried to eliminate expression. So I used that kind of character first. And that's why for a long time I used that simple line and nose to simplify. Simplify the, the facial features. But once that's happened, it comes a point where the black line becomes a became a barrier for me. I couldn't move past that black line and I wanted to be a bit more painterly and I wanted to change the style because also there were other people doing my work in Sheffield you, uh, imitating me and I wanted to sort of move, move the goalpost a little bit. So if you saw the first image, that was one of my first ever paintings and that was um, in the Washington pub. Um, that was the first show in 2004 and that was called the, he's the waltzer boy. And uh, so he was like the guy when I was a kid, you'd look up to uh, on the waltzer and you were like this eye and is this immense kind of cool dude. And funny enough though, the, the waltzer boy in that one, it's, it's actually more, the waltzer boys in the seventies were more like Lapierre and uh, Beniats, uh, Bobolats. But the, the fifties one is more based on uh, that'll be the day which was David Essex and Ringo Starr. So it's an amalgamation. So I ended up trying this style, which is taking the lines out and becoming a, little, a lot more painterly. So I still use emulsion paint, and I, uh, uh, but it's quite hard <laughs> it's, uh, to move it around. So I have to use like an inhibitor to stop it drying out within seconds. So I've been trying this style recently just to give myself a different narrative with how I, how I approach my work. So, yeah, we'll go on. S is for Sheffield. I love Sheffield. Sheffield's the greatest place on earth. We're all lucky to be here and live in Sheffield. It's a wonderful city. It's the centre of the UK. It's surrounded by trees. And everybody who lives here is beautiful and lovely and kind and nice. And so these two paintings is Hole in the Road, the fish tank in the Hole in the Road. 
again, really early painting. I tried to be really abstract with that and not put any features in to keep it, simplify it and bring it to its core, core, uh, core features. So you made up the idea that there's fish in there and you can put it in yourself what those fish look like. And this one is actually the last days of Castle Market. And again, it's like my mum type figure. I'm trying to represent my mum in a sense there. Uh, and that's the uh, threatening bit, news agents, which is outside the Pond Street, which isn't there anymore. But I got like kind of um, analytical about myself, about my paintings in Sheffield and whether it's bad to be seen as a local artist, whether it's actually like kind of denigrates you that here you are, this is local artist Pete McKee doing paintings in Sheffield and stuff. But if you, if you look at other artists, if you look at, say, uh, at Monet, he just stayed in his garden and painted his water lilies for years, <laughs> didn't shift off his art. The same with like Van Gogh, he went down into the cornfields for like two years and painted 300 paintings of cornfields and stuff. And we, we forget, we, 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 we're, we forget that artists um, wouldn't travel very far. And when, when they're there, they'd stay there and paint everything around them and see. So Salvador Dali, for instance, he just painted uh, his, his surroundings all the time. His background is from where he came from, you know. And so I, I try not to worry myself too much about the idea that Pete, the Sheffield artist, paints pictures of Sheffield. But I do try not to necessarily always do Sheffield paintings and make Sheffield name, uh, you know, name city, uh, name specific parts. But every now and again, I just love to. Uh, oh, just put that one back up. Yeah, so that's Mimi, my beautiful woman. And that's a, a take on American Gothic and that's uh, Sheffield Gothic. And it's kind of the parody of uh, how we now convert factories into coffee bars and and, and cafes and nice boutique clothing places. And so I'm like joking, having a croissant and Jane's having a nilly coffee and that's how we gentrify the area. But to be honest with you, if they didn't do that, then it'd just get knocked down and ruined. So I'm actually, I'm quite cool with like gentrification, especially in industrial areas. So I'm, I'm all for that because I like a nice coffee. <laughs> Taking a trip. So yeah, the seasidey ones. So again, making sure that when you paint, you're making people feel happy. And there's no finer place to be than on the holiday, is there? I mean, I didn't go abroad till I was like 13. And then it took me another five years before I actually went on a plane to anywhere that was actually warm. So, so, my, so I, I just love the idea of like uh, bringing joy into people's lives. And like I say, holidays is that very quick way of doing that. Just that instant joyous um, buzz of the seaside. And that's uh, Let's Get Lost. And Let's Get Lost is just simply that romantic picture, but the also title of it is from one of my favorite artists, musicians, which is Chet Baker. And the song, one of my favorite songs, Let's Get, Let's Get Lost. Oh, right, we got, we're coming towards the end now, so I'm gonna give you a little break from me talking. Ukuleles, I once saw a documentary with Woody Allen, and he was playing clarinet in a jazz bar. I thought, oh, wow. So he's got, he does something else that nobody, else, it's not anything to do with film, it's just for him. And uh, so me and my friend chose ukuleles to play. And I just thought it was gonna be for a laugh, but I didn't realize it would end up with like two and a half thousand people pay, paying 20 quid to see us play live. So here's, I'm gonna show you another no pine. This is my, my acting comes to the fore and my love of nans. It'll come up, here we go. Time for a wee. <laughs> that was my son, that. That was, about, that was a bit traumatic for him. This was actually filmed in uh, Graves Art Gallery in the uh, 
50's kitchen. Yeah, there's a shy. I make a good nun, don't I? I weren't expecting that, to be honest. I got a friend to bake um, three meat and potato pies for this. One was a dummy one and one was proper. And we ended up eating the dummy one, which didn't have any gravy in it, just potato. So look, the driest meat potato pie you've ever seen in your entire life. Yeah, that's gross. There we go. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, we can move that on now. <laughs> Well, we are the rest anyway from me talking for two minutes. So, uh, this vinyl, lover of music, lover of vinyl. But the important thing about vinyl is that it's a kid's first introduction to fine art in a lot of respects. We don't normally go to art galleries with our parents, but well, we didn't in the 70s anyway, but we did have people who own records. And so, is a gamut of collection of art, fine art on record sleeves and Captain Fantastic, my brother owned that and I was just besotted by the artwork on that one. And there's no self-respecting kid who was into art, wouldn't take an LP sleeve into art class and attempt to draw it in a bad way at all. It's, it's a passage, of, it's a rites of passage. But I've been lucky enough to uh, do some LP sleeves, so Human League's one of them. And then also, what else we got? Yeah, Rhoda Dakar, who bless her, I'm gonna play with on Friday, we've got a little gig. So she used to be, sing with the specials. Great, and uh, that's for the lead mull. So that's a crowd scene for the lead mull. Uh, and I also um, like to paint record sleeves, but they, they kill me when I do them. I, I, I did a collection, is there any more on those? Is that it? Yeah, so, so yeah, I, so every now and again I like to paint record shop paintings and just delve into those be the beautiful art of LP sleeves. So vinyl is, an, again, a, a lovely key area uh, to focus on. Uh, right, Wednesday till I die. Well, the mighty Wednesday at Wembley on Monday. What about that? Victorious. But not only uh, did Wednesday as an art career start with the fanzine. This is Pele with his Santos team at Hillsborough um, playing against Sheffield Wednesday. And in 1972, they came again. And this is the program, and this is my brother's program. 
for Santos. He collects programs, his, and this was his pride and joy. And I was six at the time, and I saw this program, and I looked at it, and I decided it needed some art on it. <laughs> so I have wanted to thank for my burgeoning art career. It's also got a clip round Eero for it as well from my brother who never forgave me until my 50th birthday when he presented this in the frame as a, as a gift. <laughs> so, uh, oh, kiss. X is for kissing and the snog. So I decided uh, for the Joyous Chef uh, exhibition, I would promote it by doing a great piece of wall art. And this is Fagan's pub. And I went into Tom at Fagan's, the landlord, and I said, Tom, can I paint a picture? He said, yes. <laughs> he said, yeah, I'm finished. He said, yeah, paint a picture on the side of my wall, no problem. And so the snog was the lead uh, image for the show. And so it's the Joyous Chef, which is a play on the Joyous Sex. And then this image is a rip of the Joyous Sex book cover front page, where it's a beardy man and a lady, semi-dressed, snogging each other. And I thought it'd be quite funny to use that as the lead for this. But I'd never done street art before. I'd never done anything so big. I had no idea what I was supposed to do. So I, bump, I got lucky and I bumped into Flem, who was a Sheffield street artist. And he was in Sheffield at that time, living in Sheffield. And I bumped into him in the supermarket of all places. I said, oh, Flem, I'm glad I bumped into you. I'm about to do this piece of street art and I've no idea what I'm supposed to do. What can I do? I said, all right, it's no problem. You can use any material. You don't have to use spray paints and also it's always good to kind of maybe you can grid it up or you can project it, uh, whatever, all artists do different things. I said, oh, thanks, a great bit of advice. So I've got a mate and he works in production and he says he's got this projector and it'll project onto this wall really big and you can just trace around it. So that morning we go down, we've hired a scissor lift to get us up and down. That's the scissor lift. And the guy, oh, ooh, can we stop that for a sec? <laughs> Not there yet. Then the guy, who, uh, he, uh, the guy helped us out. See that factory there? There was a factory behind it, and he stored it in there for us, and he drove it all the way around and stopped the traffic while they drove up to get to it. And I got there in the morning on the Saturday mo Sunday morning. He gets the projector, this guy, sets it up, shines it on, and it's about that big. <laughs> oh, oh. I'm like, man alive! <laughs> That's not that. So what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And I got a picture of it anyway, what I knew I was going to work on. And there were a piece of, like a, a long piece of board, like a, I don't like skirting board. And it were about a metre long. I thought, that, we're going to have to grid it up. We're going to have to grid it up now. So I started drawing it like this. We're going to do like um, Leonardo da Vinci or whatever. Who did, who did the Sistine Chapel? Who was it? Michelangelo. Grid it up like Michelangelo's. He gridded it on that, got this piece of board, and I eventually gridded it all up. And then me and Chris, uh, in one day, did this, because we didn't want that bloke to be bothered with scissor lift driving it back round again. So here's a video of it. So I'm roughly I'm roughing it out with like kind of watered down brown paint. <coughs> And I'd, I'd penciled it, roughly penciled it in. So we're just getting the basics. And he's, we're both clinging on for dear life because not, neither of us is like heights. <laughs> so it's slowly taking shape. Uh, big spray kit paint now on this. First time I've ever done that. And it's like one of those things when uh, this is the fortune of doing something for the first time, it, it tends to work. But then the second time, it's an absolute disaster. And uh, I got invited down to Shoreditch, uh, the mecca of uh, street art, to do a piece, and I did a shit job. <laughs> <laughs> and all these like uh, street art gurus who were like were watching me, they were just like, <sighs> <laughs> and there were a woman like complaining at me because the one, the piece that was up before it, were nice. <laughs> I said, "Why well, they taken that one down and put this up? It's a dog. Uh, I'm here. We, we, tell you tell it, telling me about it here. Be rude about me behind me back." So yeah, and then we just start filling it in bit by bit, big paint brushes rather than spray paint. Um, oh, is that spray paint? I can, no, it's a paintbrush. I, I got that paint from Lowe's, by the way, which is an Abbeydale, very good paint. <laughs> <laughs> they did me a good, bar, good deal on it. <laughs> but I'm duty bound to point, me, point you in their direction. 
But the beautiful thing about the snog was how instantly uh, it got accepted by everybody and how, to this day, it's not being graffitied over, which is a, a, an, an absolute blessing. Not being tagged on and everything. But yeah, it's, it's great how people have owned it now. It's, it's a piece of Sheffield, which I'm very, very proud of. There, there we are. Proud lad, the end of it all. <laughs> Cheers. I think I'm supposed to be doing one for Henderson's at some point, Aunt Mo, Aunt Mo, so that'd be nice. We're in the end now. Why is for youth? And basically, um, it, it's that's the backfield, basically. The six week holidays are great, aren't they, when you were a kid? You just basically got left on your, to your own devices. Parents loved it because you weren't murdering them. You got kicked out into a field and you made dens and you got into trouble and you scraped your knees and you hurt your wrists and uh, came home mucky. And then someone ended up breaking their hand at first week of six week holidays. And the obliquely tree, ah. <laughs> yes. The, the, God bless evil Knievel and people who died, uh, died trying to follow him. Yeah, so oh, we just go back there. <laughs> the stick there is a marker where the, where the bike landed last. <laughs> and that lad's just looking at it. Saying, hang on, is that near my kidneys? And, and you know, there was, a, there, was a, there was a team of people. There was a ramp builder and the ramp jumper. And uh, I was a ramp builder and this little kid who was a ramp jumper because he was small and lightweight and he managed to get over people. But yeah, what, what, time, what a time to live. What, with danger like that, amazing. <laughs> and that brings us on to Z, and it's time for bed. So, I've done. You can go home. And that's me dad having a kid for an afternoon. So I think I'm nearly done. I'll have done. And we've only got three minutes left. Amazing, isn't that? I haven't even timed it. Thank you.